Hello and welcome to another Dev Nation Live Tech Talk. I've been fine-tuning my microphone a little bit. Maybe it sounds a little better this stream. But I see DJ Maddie's already here. He's ready to talk about operators with Josh, and I'm excited to have Josh here because we're going to talk about what it means to fully automate things within your OpenShift or Kubernetes cluster with the concept of the operators and operator SDK. Josh, as you know, is an author who worked on this topic with the O'Reilly, uh, with the O'Reilly publisher, and so with uh, also another member of the OpenShift team, Jason Dobies, and him put together a nice book. We'll talk about that and give you a free link to the book a little bit later. But right now, I'll turn it over to Josh and dive right into the topic. Josh, over to you. Hey, thanks, Burr, and thanks everybody for coming this afternoon. Um, yeah, as Burr started out introducing, we're going to talk a little bit today about uh, operators, something I almost am always talking about when, when people are letting me talk, um, and not just the basics and really not the implementation, but the theory and practice that motivated the concept and the pattern in the first place, and how to apply those patterns to develop more uh, advanced automation um, for your operator as you iterate through development on it. So with the usual graceful switch over to my slide share, um, I'm going to share my screen and give a quick glance at Burr, who usually lets me know if it's coming through all right. And uh, we'll dive right into this. Now, I assume uh, a lot of the folks uh, who've shown up today probably already know the answer to this question. So we're not going to spend a lot of time uh, on the, the background of your motivation for writing operators, but I do want to run through it really quickly because it is the, it is the central truth about what we're doing here that, that brings us together to build operators and talk about what they are today and what they can be in the future in the first place. So here's why I think you care about operators. You may even have heard me say this before, but the key thing about operators is that any application in any system on any platform has to be installed or deployed configured, managed, and upgraded over time. Um, those are central facts, whether I'm writing a web browser for a desktop computer and I want to install it, I want to upgrade it as new patches and new features come out, and I want to preserve the user's configuration smoothly through those up upgrades. Or if I'm writing a mobile application for uh, the Apple App Store or Android phones, and I want the same kind of behavior, which is, how do I get this thing on the device? How do I keep it updated over time? Uh, how do I manage it while it runs, keep it running? And how do I preserve users' preferences and configuration through upgrade cycles uh, that are being managed by uh, a software upgrade system instead of by user intervention uh, manually at, at each upgrade point? Corollary to this idea of automation uh, being key in the uh, installation and lifecycle management of apps is the idea that patching is absolutely critical to security. In other words, making sure we've got the latest version of a piece of software running is one of our key protections in the, in the kind of arms race we find ourselves with against software vulnerabilities. The easiest way to make sure all known vulnerabilities are fixed in a piece of software I'm running is to make sure I'm running the latest version of that software. If I can, up, if I can automate those upgrades, um, I've applied a lot of time, cost, and complexity savings, and I'm avoiding a lot of risk just by piling those patches into an application as I use it over, over its life cycle. So anything that isn't automated in this way in your processes of development, deployment, management, upgrading, backing up and restoring is slowing you down and preventing you from doing interesting, innovative work and adding customer facing features to an application or resiliency feature, resilience features to a service in favor of instead doing rote work of just keeping things up to date, patched and keeping them running when they fall over. Autom um, automation is clearly a good idea. It's why we like Kubernetes. If we're running a simple static, or a simple stateless app, it's really easy to automate things like scaling an app up and down. In fact, we've got a kubectl command. We can just ask the API to scale our, our static web server from one copy to three, and it does this for us. If one falls over, it's real easy to replace because there's no state. We don't need to know anything about that application. But this doesn't hold for most of the applications that lie at the foundations of the software we build. Databases, file systems have persistent data, and moreover, a lot of them have their own notions of clustering and other complexities of configuration that would be really nice if we could move away from human operators into software operators, Kubernetes operators. The most direct example of this I usually use to get people in the right headspace is it's still easy to deploy a database on Kubernetes. You find some image and you deploy it. 
Um, you create a deployment with some idealized database, and now I've got a database running. But running that thing over time is a lot harder than just deploying it. All of the things I've mentioned, I've got a persistent data store to keep track of. I'm going to have upgrades against security vulnerabilities and providing new features to that database application over time. And that database may have its own idea of what its cluster looks like, and it may have a, a write leader and read followers or another hierarchical system governing the behavior among the members of a database cluster that's in turn running on top of our Kubernetes cluster. Now, Kubernetes clearly doesn't know about all of that application-specific internal state. It would be nice in particular instances if Kubernetes did know about the application-specific internal state of our database cluster so that it could take automated steps to keep it running over time in the same way that we're used to Kubernetes managing stateless applications that are fungible and easily replaced by simply another copy of the same thing. Operators are a way of teaching Kubernetes these new tricks in a particular Kubernetes installation at a site. In other words, when we write an operator, we don't change the global Kubernetes API. We extend the Kubernetes API that's running on our cluster or at our local site. And we do that by providing basically two things that constitute the meat and soul of an operator. That is a custom resource definition that describes some application internal state that we want to track and manage with a reconcile loop and an application-specific custom controller in the Kubernetes control plane that watches that custom resource for the desired state described in it and takes application-specific actions with internal knowledge of the application state to reconcile that application running on the cluster to the desired state described in the custom resource. So it extends the Kubernetes uh, decision loop or reconciliation loop that we're familiar with in the center of the Kubernetes control plane to specific applications. And that controller is where you can write the logic that understands that application's internal state, while the CRD and its instantiation, the custom resource, the CR, are the API representation of that application state as a first class citizen in the Kubernetes API. So that's operators, why and what, um, in what I think is a pretty clean seven minutes, just to get everybody backgrounded and on the same page. Before we dive into, if that's why I care about operators and that's what an operator notionally is um, at the level where it extends the Kubernetes API, what are they really for? What do you do with operators? So we've started out with a little description, and this is kind of an expanded picture of that idea of a reconciliation loop. I've got a custom resource here in the second column that describes some internal state about my database uh, server that you might notice has some words in it that are not typical parts of uh, Kubernetes API specification stanzas um, in a standard or a stock Kubernetes resource. Things like connection pool size and how many read replicas are in this cluster of my so-called production-ready database imaginary DB server. Now, what the operator is, is a bunch of logic or handlers that know what to do when the real world state of the cluster of the, of its operand, the application it manages, doesn't match that, uh, desired state expressed in, in our custom resource over here. So through watch events and notifiers, our custom controller the, log, the, uh, the, the executable part of the operator running in the control plane gets flagged of changes to the custom resource, uh, making changes to the desired state, and to changes in the real world state running on the cluster that may cause the application, the operator's so-called operand, to uh, get out of spec uh, with, with that custom resource. So looking at a little more detail at this custom resource that's kind of idealized for a database, you can see what we're able to do in short is extend the API to describe the things that are important to us. In this case, there's things that are specific to a notional uh, database service that runs in a cluster. But what operators really are, I sometimes say automated software managers, but if we expand that concept a little more, it can give us some hints about what an operator should do beyond the basic install and upgrade cycle that we're familiar with, that, that I talk about, that I've spent the first part of this talk sort of uh, outlining, 
and expand that to more advanced operations and more advanced automation with operators. And that is if I think of an operator in a way that we did way back four years ago at CoreOS when we were sort of generating the idea of the operator pattern. And that is operators are software SREs that site reliability engineers in software that know all about managing an application for which they're responsible, their operand. They know how to manage the whole life cycle of that thing, from installing and deploying it, to keeping it running, to upgrading it over time, to sampling it for metrics that indicate performance conditions and even proactively taking steps to reconcile those conditions that, that metrics may let, um, may let us see arising, right? So, <clears throat> Once again, sorry, let's just actually dive right into this. I was going to go off and talk a little bit about business value of operators, but I think that's probably implied in the idea that we know we want to deploy apps on Kubernetes. We know this is a space for programming advanced automations of those deployments. Um, so I think a lot of the business value that we might just get into the weeds on is kind of uh, implied by that. And I want to look at what this means in an implementation way across all of those operators that we've seen. Red Hat itself, uh, our partners, ISVs, and members of the community populate the operator hub and other distribution points with over, over the last uh, year or two years since the introduction of the SDK and since we've seen adoption by this, uh, adoption of this pattern um, in the wider Kubernetes community. So when we think about operators and all the different things we can do with an operator by programming in this space, at Red Hat, we've kind of come up with this idea of maturity phases. And an operator tends to progress through these, and we see this both in our own work on operators we build around OpenShift to uh, extend Kubernetes with OpenShift-specific services, around the applications that we manage ourselves and ship on that platform, and we see it in what our customers and partners are doing with operators. And so we break an operator's possibilities or potential down into these kind of five, not really discrete, they certainly um, bleed into one another at their margins, but this is kind of five phases to use to help us think about or understand uh, the different kinds of things and the more advanced operations that we can do with operators. So over here on the left, we've got some pretty familiar things. The things you probably think of when you think of an operator as a software packaging and distribution mechanism. And if you're pulling operators out of the operator hub to be foundation applications for your apps that you're building on top of OpenShift or Kubernetes clusters, you probably think of operators a lot as a way to package an application and provide that, that um, upgrader functionality that like I mentioned before, we're really used to from web browsers and mobile applications doing auto updates or from Linux and other Unix package management systems coordinating updates for a group of applications on a machine. So those things are kind of in phase one and phase two. They're over here where we're talking about does the operator do a basic install of its operand? Get it deployed, get it running, provide status about whether it's running. Um, on through upgrading that application. And then in phase three, four, and five, the really cool things, the things where I think SRE principles have advice um, and ideas for what we should be building in operators as we advance them through these maturity levels. So what do we mean when we talk about SRE? Well, SRE is made famous by Google. There's a really famous book called the SRE book. Its real title is Site Reliability Engineering, and that is, of course, the expansion of our acronym here. What SRE is about in terms of this, according to this book, is a view of automation being key to reliably delivering services at scale. Carla Geiser, who's a, who is or was at the time of writing the book an SRE at Google running these services, actually has a great quote, and, and I like it so much that I quoted her in, in our book about operators. And, and Ms. Geiser says that any time a system requires human intervention, that that's a bug. And I actually think there's a lot of guidance there for how you decide what your operators should do for your applications after you get them past the point of phase one and two, install and upgrade. Every time the pager rings, we're looking for processes that we can have the operator automatically react to instead of ringing an actual human SRE. In other words, we're really trying to promote our operator to uh, an SRE title of its own uh, in software. <clears throat> so. If human intervention that a system requires unexpectedly is a bug, if a pager ring is a bug, 
site reliability engineers write code to fix those bugs. S SREs write software that runs and manages other software. That implies that SREs write Kubernetes operators. Operators were generated to be a space to do the kind of engineering um, that attempts to write code to run other software. That is, in fact, what an operator is. It manages the lifecycle of an application, its operand, and is responsible for the reliable operation of that operand. <clears throat> so quickly, we'll look at levels one and two to give us context for a little bit deeper dive on levels three, four, and five, and actual ideas for data points and feedback loops you can be looking for to increase the sophistication of the automation um, that you can build in operators for your apps. Now, in, in our idea, uh, our kind of idealized uh, chart of maturity phases, we talk about level one as an operator that can handle the installation or the deployment of its operand. Some key questions that are set out that can help you identify if you're doing this is, can I set the configuration and declare my desire for an instance of the operand, the application my operator manages with a custom resource and manage it entirely through that custom resource so that I can manage it in Kubernetes terms with Kubernetes tools as a first class entity in the API. When I make changes to that custom resource, can the operand carry them out as non-disruptive changes in the application it's managing? If I ask an operator to scale up a complicated database cluster, can it provide the necessary authentication assets, uh, um, API endpoint locations, and the other things a new node needs to join an existing cluster of three or four databases that are already running is an example of this. Um, and perhaps I think something that's a lot of times overlooked in a lot of the operators that I see in the field does the status field in that custom resource provide useful and unique to the operator and its operand information about the status of what has and hasn't been applied when I'm having an operator do one of these deployments? In other words, I should be able to do something like a kubectl describe on my custom resource and understand what the state of the application is that the operator is managing. Um, and I think there's, um, we're pretty thin on the ground in a lot of the operators I see even in the hub uh, on this status being useful and being a key where when our automation goes wrong, a, a human has, has an index into troubleshooting it. And the first line of defense right here is your status fields um, inside the custom resources that your operators manage. At level two, we're really just saying if at level one we could do an install, can we can we repeat that process uh, in a, in a uh, discrete, manageable, and non-disruptive way? Can we do upgrades? So can the operator upgrade its operand when new versions come out? Can the operator handle upgrading or managing an older version of the operand when the operator itself sees a new version? Can it do those things without disruption? And again, does the status field in the custom resource that your operator is managing show useful information about the state of these upgrades and especially error messages about things that go wrong. Whenever we're increasingly automating a process, it, it's somewhat ironic, but we actually wanna make sure our error statements are clearer and louder because the more I automate a process, the more I'm gonna look away from it and not be paying attention to it. Um, <clears throat> so I think that's continually key at all of these stages is that idea of state of your application that your operator's managing being clearly reflected in status and events back in that custom resource. <clears throat> so at, at level three, things are finally starting to get a little more interesting. We're not just rewriting package management software anymore. We're leveraging that simplified and automated package management to build increasing automation and get increasing information back uh, about the apps we're monitoring. So at level three, we think of this as full lifecycle management. <clears throat> My favorite example of what that means is beyond deploying it, keeping it running and scaling it and upgrading it when an app sees new, uh, new versions, is can your operator make a backup of your database application or your file server application. A great example of this is in the etcd operator. Um, there's an etcd operator, there's an etcd backup operator, and there's an etcd restore operator. Because if you have a backup, then a key question becomes, can your operator restore from one of those backups that it previously created? 
I would add to this, even though I've kind of uh, left it off the slide, that once again, is the CR that your operator manages that represents this, this application entity in the API, is it your point of control for triggering and monitoring these lifecycle management tasks outside of the application, like a backup or, or a restore from backup? When your operator deploys an app, does it configure it on Kubernetes or OpenShift with readiness or liveness probes? Does it do active monitoring of the basic execution state uh, given the platform tools that are already provided? Out of the box, an operator can set its application or its operand up with a lot of uh, features for doing basic monitoring of is the thing running or not? Is it ready to uh, receive requests and process them successfully or not? Going right along with this is the idea of when we deploy an app, an operator can configure CPU requests and limits, memory and disk requests and limits, other things specific to its application that it knows uh, a good basic default dimension for, for configuring those limits and those requests for an app uh, when it deploys it. <clears throat> so that's kind of a picture of what, what we're looking at at level three. And now is where we're just starting to get um, an inkling of, of SRE thinking. Uh, about constantly engineering the reliability of a site or a service um, entering. And that is, when, when you look at this idea of basic monitoring, it implies something we talk about um, in SRE uh, all the time, uh, <clears throat> and that is, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> something we talk about in SRE all the time, which is um, uh, this idea of uh, monitoring and observability of applications. So in SRE, we have this idea of uh, four golden signals, and we're going to get into that a little bit more as we get into level four. But you can see the first hints of that there where we're setting up readiness and liveness probes that the platform offers us just so that we have a basic feedback loop that's starting to inform our operator and then potentially be something we can build decision structures on top of as we advance towards uh, levels four and five. So in level four is where we really see the um, uh, the uh, the intersection of of this idea of where you can program this stuff in an operator with what should we be programming. In SRE, we talk a lot about uh, four golden signals, uh, latency and errors, um, uh, traffic. <clears throat> And we have kind of a simplified picture that we use to talk about that inside a Red Hat a lot that we call the uh, the Red method, or uh, um, uh, which we'll look at here in just a second. But when we get to level four, the idea is: does the operator expose more detailed metrics about its own health and its own operation, and especially metrics and alerts that are specific to the internal state of that operand that the operator is managing? Um, for a database system, this might be something like request per second, and we can start to think about decision trees within the operator that make decisions of scaling up or down based around that metric and our historical expectations um, from, from our operator configuring this app with, with metrics uh, at deployment time and at upgrade times. So things like Prometheus exporter libraries are your friend here configuration for them can be done at deploy time by an operator that knows um, what internal uh, metrics we need to be looking at to reflect the health and the consistent reliable uh, operation of the of the app that we're managing. Now again, even at level four, I wanna return to the idea that the status in the custom resource really should provide this, this information back or to scale it up to the level of custom events for, for the Kubernetes event stream that reflects specific data about the internal state um, of the app that we're, that, that we're managing uh, with an operator as it moves towards level four. So what are some of the metrics that we should be looking at as we start to build towards first a fully informed operator and then an operator that can use that information to start making proactive decisions as we proceed towards uh, what we think of as level five on, on the maturity model chart. So we talk a lot about this red idea, which is really a boiling down of the four golden signals. Um, and in fact, each of them match one of the four. So there's the rate, the, the, the frequency with which a service is being accessed. In, in SRE, that golden signal is called traffic, but these are the same thing. The rate of errors, um, which is also one of the key golden signals um, that gets duplicated in this sort of red simplification of the idea of what we should be looking at. 
and the duration or latency of requests. Measuring these three things in any system gives us a pretty good high level idea of the health of that system or application. So um, for a web application, for, for example, rate is this idea of request per second. Duration is this idea of latency. How long does it take between receiving a request and uh, processing a, a return on that function and handing it back to the client who made the request? That total amount of time is, is your duration or your latency. And for an application with a historical picture of that latency over time, this is a major clue to uh, how successful it's being moment to moment at managing the, uh, the, the traffic that's coming into that service. So whether you want to talk about golden signals from SRE terminology, or you want to boil it down to this thing red, if, you're, if your operator is measuring the traffic, the errors, and the latency of its application, it already has a good picture of what we might call the application's vital signs. It's uh, basic um, indicators of, of its healthy operation and, and the rate at which it's consuming re resources. So at level five, we start to build on that idea of, uh, of, of, of carefully collected metrics specific to the application's internals of, of rate errors and duration or latency to actually build um, uh, handlers and functions in the operator that make decisions and take actions proactively based not just on an up-down indicator for a service, but some internal metric of that service's current performance. Um, latency is one of my favorite examples there because as latency increases, we usually see an uptick in resource consumption rate and all of the other things that can indicate that a service needs to be scaled, for instance, horizontally or vertically. So one of the things we can do is detect these kind of increasing latencies in an operator and then actually have the operator to take action to scale our operand either horizontally by adding replicas or uh, potentially vertically by adjusting those uh, requests and limits that we set out for our operand uh, back at deploy time. We're sort of talking about configuring something at deploy time back, back in level three. So levels three and four have given us a platform to then start building um, these things we call autopilot automations in level five operators, where we really are getting to a point where if our reconcile loop triggers anything that rings a pager or needs a human, we can address that um, as a bug and write code to fix that bug. That's a feature we can add to the operator so that hopefully when we see that situation arise again, the operator can take action to avert or repair that situation rather than a human being needing to, um, uh, to, to intervene. Um, so even again at this level of sort of auto scaling and tuning, I have two kind of key recommendations, I think, when, when we start to build operators at this level of sophistication. One is to be a broken record about status. Inside that custom resource and by providing custom Kubernetes events, the more your operator automates the whole life cycle of your app, I, it is conversely more and more important for error conditions to be communicated early, often, and very clearly because the nature of automation is that human beings will be looking at the service less and less as the operator makes it an autopiloted service. Um, one of my favorite models from the non-software world to look at for a, an easy enough to understand but sophisticated enough to be useful physical model of a feedback loop with a controller is a marine autopilots, a thing that lets you set a course and it'll steer your boat especially those marine autopilots that have rudder position sensors that constitute the feedback loop uh, versus the, the heading input into the, into the autopilot device actually really depict in a physical way the same kind of controls that operators should be exercising over their operands. They take input from that rudder sensor uh, versus the tracking of a heading programmed into it to keep a boat on a steady course. And they do that in a constant reconciliation loop, much like we talk about with Kubernetes controllers and the custom controllers that represent Kubernetes operators. So level five to kind of jump up one more level of uh, abstraction into a little philosophy. As we put in our book, and uh, that may be a quote from Ecclesiastes, toil not, neither spin. The SRE book, the famous SRE book from Google, 
defines this idea of toil as work that we should constantly be striving to relieve humans of. Toil is work that's automatable. Your computer would like doing it. It happens over and over again. A person will probably get bored. Toil is work that is necessary but without enduring value. And within SRE, that means I need to do it, but it doesn't change the state of the system. It doesn't make the system better, add a feature, or add capacity. Backups are actually a great idea of this repetitive toil that doesn't really have enduring value in the system they're backing up. Are backups valuable? Oh, absolutely, they're essential, but they don't change the state of the system. Um, and then the last type of toil that I think it's really cool, key to be analyzing at all times inside your teams to see if you can move it into software in Kubernetes operators is the kind of work that grows linearly along with the growth of a system. In other words, if I get a thousand new users and I need to deploy a server and a human being needs to deploy a new server each time we get a new a thousand new users, that's exactly the kind of work we're talking about automating away to, again, the underlying concept of all of this is continually to hand toil to machines, to free human beings to do innovative, customer-facing, value-adding features work or bug repair work. Um, so this philosophically is what we're trying to bundle together. And Kubernetes operators are a space or a scaffolding for exactly this kind of SRE programming um, for managing applications on Kubernetes. So I hope uh, that in that high-speed run through of these phases, I've at least generated some ideas. Once you've written an operator that deploys your app and keeps it upgraded, you've got it in the operator hub or in the Red Hat marketplace, and users are getting value from you just simplifying their lives at the deployment phase, these are the things that you can start to use to expand your operator into continually more and more sophisticated automation of, of the application that, that it manages. And so what we're trying to do is push everyone towards phase five uh, so that I can do lots more phishing and, and lots, lots less service monitoring. Uh -oh. So before I wrap up and take a few questions, I notice I'm over time, but I know from the last one we can, we can run a little long. Uh, here's some things that I think about uh, when I think about the operator space. I think of these as like experiments or challenge coins. Um, in the famous academic phrase, left as an exercise for the reader. Of course, like I just said, the key space is doing that site reliability engineering programming and automation inside of the operator uh, space. Add metrics awareness and then use those metrics as a feedback loop that can help your operator tune your, your application's performance and constantly keep it running at its best levels. But the other thing operators represent is a way to build other APIs and API representations as extensions of the Kubernetes API. And because of, of, a, of a, a lost youth in Plan 9 uh, programming, I have this idea that I'd really love to see a, a Kate's FS. Uh, a, a, a Kubernetes API presented as a synthetic file hierarchy, right? So in Plan 9, this is a standard way of programming anything. Um, if I have a service, I represent it as a collection of files, and then I interact with that service by reading those files and writing those files with uh, standard POSIX read, write, uh, open, close semantics. And that means if I, if I had this, this file system representation of the API and an operator was responsible for presenting this synthetic file hierarchy, I'd be able to do things like copy a manifest file into a deployments folder to instantiate that deployment, to declare my desired state, and then have the cluster go about making that desired state real. Um, I might be able to adjust scaling like we illustrated earlier with the Kubernetes scale command, the kubectl scale command, by echoing the number of replicas I want into a deployments replicas file, as I kind of illustrate in this last command line. So clearly this is something that um, at best I have tinkered with. Uh, so when there's a Git repo, I'll, I'll update everyone and point you there. But this is one of the ideas I have about even beyond the idea of, of SRE automations, what kind of APIs can we build that simplify the presentation of Kubernetes to certain classes of users or that represent a whole different problem domains API needs while still being able to use Kubernetes to, uh, to handle deployment and, and scaling tasks um, like we do uh, for, for web services and other things. Uh, we see maybe uh, telco vendors building entire services 
that are built on Kubernetes, but don't expose the Kubernetes or the OpenShift APIs in any way. They just expose a much simplified uh, problem domain API that's provided by that operator. So those are sort of the really futuristic things that, that I think we'll see people build um, as we advance, maybe even beyond level five in that operator chart too. What kind of uh, what kind of APIs and representations can we build on top of the of this uh, kernel like core that, that Kubernetes becomes more and more every day? So um, we'll we'll give you some pointers to some resources. These slides will be available shortly after I finish speaking. Uh, certainly on speakerdeck.com slash joshix, um, which I'll have coming up in the next slide. And uh, last but not least, I want to point you at Maya and Jason Doby's book about Kubernetes operators. Chapter nine in that book is actually a much extended and elaborated version of the discussion we've tried to kick off here today. Um, and at that final link, that bit.ly link for the book, uh, you can get a copy free courtesy of Red Hat um, electronically. And so uh, we'd love that if you would uh, read us, read that book and give us feedback. We expect we'll be working on a second edition soon as much as this space changes and, and as rapidly as we've seen, uh, seen it grow and be adopted. So once again, I'm Josh Wood from the OpenShift Evangelist team. Um, I hope that was useful. And if you have any questions, uh, I'm right here uh, if we can get them in now. And if not, track me down at my Red Hat email address or find any way you need to contact me, dig up old slides, other papers at my website, joshix.com. Thanks. Yeah, Josh, thank you for that. So that was awesome. And, and, and there actually is a question that might still be open if DJ Maddie's still out there. He and I had a nice discussion around, well, what happens if I am rolling out a change? Let's say my operator is automating the rollout of something, right? The rollout of my application or the rollout of the database. But if I'm rolling out my application, there might also be schema changes associated with that. And if there's a problem as it lands in production and I have to roll it back, so basically, what happens in a case of when there's errors when they're in the rollout and you got to roll back from an operator design standpoint, and especially around schema changes, you know, what what do you what's your strategies around that? Dealing with errors in the so, rollout, dealing with errors in a schema change, things like that. Yeah. So okay. So in a really hand wavy general way, I can say do, do operators need to be programmed defensively and in consideration of exactly those kind of changes. I think I hinted at that with the kind of the the, the repetition of please provide status. <laughs> please make sure that there's real status coming back that's not, excuse me, just the status of the of the Kubernetes primitives we're already using or the Kubernetes events we're already using by, say, uh, creating a deployment or, or a, a replica set or any of the other existing things. The, the application-specific things need to be reported back in, in status. But at, at a at a, to, the, to that specific question about schema changes, if you look at uh, the etcd operator, this is actually, so an operator is responsible for managing the version it ships with and in, in, in one upgrades to that version. So the etcd operator, when there's on disk uh, file format changes, is responsible for using the backup facility and the restore facility to get the data out, make the schema changes. In this case, I'm talking about on disk format changes and then bring the data back in from the restore. So I think your key tools in addressing that defensively, like to be prepared to do defensive programming inside the operator for that, are those level three and four concerns about complete um, uh, uh, complete lifecycle management. The idea of we're not just gonna manage the application, but backups and restores of that application. If I have a way to automate backup and restore, then I have a way to roll back in the face of even a failed schema change where the operator might literally have to throw up its hands and call for human intervention. But at planned upgrade points, the those schema changes are exactly the kind of thing that belongs um, in the handlers inside an operator. They're extremely application specific, they're private and internal to the application, and they're the exact kind of uh, deep application knowledge that uh, human admins of that app should seek to bake into software in an operator so that they can automate it over time. Okay. And, and I hope that's a reasonable approach to that. Right, and it's definitely something we should probably explore more. I'm not sure if the, do you, for instance, does the book deal with how to respond to errors and error conditions and rollback conditions? 
Uh, yeah, yeah. So especially in coverage of um, with the intersection of, of an operator, which is kind of what I spent today talking about for simplicity's sake. At the intersection of that idea of an operator and the operator lifecycle manager, that's an operator that manages other operators, uh, the book covers this idea of responsibility of operand versions for each operator as it progresses through its versions and um, of, of uh, backup restore based rollbacks of versions of the operator, um, let alone versions of the of the operand. OK, right. so I think that's related to the next question from DJ Maddie, which is what if I just want to do a manual rollback of that version change to the operator just because, you know, what I mean, there's just some other business reason to roll back that operator and degrade it from version 1.1 to 1.0. Yeah, so so OLM policy wise, the idea here is I should be able to do that by changing the operator's um, resource within a version back. Um, so I can I'm responsible if, if if I want to obey the rules and be a good operator citizen, my operator is going to be able if when I do that upgrade, I should be able to simply go specify the downgrade in the operator's resource. And the operator should handle that happening. Okay, now if you want to go 10 versions back, we don't have anything like a contract for that kind of responsibility for, for what, you know, how far back. That's, that's Microsoft level back, backwards compatibility and it's to be envied and admired, honestly. Right. But the, the contract right now is if I go forward one version, I can go backward one version of, of operator and operand. Okay, so the, I think that's a, I, I fear that I've gutted the value of that information by trying to simplify it, but I, I think that's a reasonable answer. Well, and James wants to know more about Ansible as an example. So I'm, I'm wondering for any of these situations, I know operators can be based on Ansible playbooks, but what are some of the limits in this category? Yeah. When we talk about error handling, rollbacks, you know. So this is actually good. And, and some, of the, some folks who know older versions of this uh, maturity model chart might remember when the the lines for Helm and Ansible were much shorter than the lines for Go down here at the bottom um, that I brought uh, that I'm not actually still sharing. So I'm just talking about an, an error here. But if we remember on the chart um, and we look at this this idea of uh, so so we can build operators basically in, inside the, the the operator SDK three different ways. We can start with a Helm chart and generate an operator from that 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 really is going to be oriented just like Helm itself toward phase one and phase two, getting it installed and potentially being able to upgrade it. But it's going to be hard to provide logic in Helm terms because it's beyond Helm's own scope for phase three, four, and five, these kind of advanced automations. However, in the Go programming language and in Ansible-based operators, we actually have the language tools we need to, to write uh, an Ansible-based operator that, that is as sophisticated as any go based operator so if if you got a lot of ansible playbooks uh already in use um the sdk gives you a way to bring those forward convert them into basic operators and then the sdk and surrounding ansible tools let you continue programming in the ansible space to extend your operator into phase three four and five and do increasingly sophisticated automation with it now i don't know ansible nearly as well as I know Go, and I don't know Go nearly as well as someone who's actually a good programmer. <laughs> but, but so I do most of this programming in Go. Uh, but certainly Ansible is a whole other framework that we can approach the same level of sophistication with. So on that that phase chart, Ansible co potentially covers all five phases in the same way that an operator written in Go and using the the SDK does. So the the limitations there are key if you're starting with a Helm chart. Um, but if you're if you're in the Ansible or Go space, you you have the same capabilities. You can you can get an operator to the same kind of uh, phase five level of sophistication. If only there are more time time for this stream as well as time in my day because that is something I'd be very interested in exploring is how do I do decision logic and in, in Ansible playbooks loops you know all the standard programmatic things you can do to basically say loop until we no longer have this error error right. and then if this do that else do this and Exception handling. I've never really explored that with a playbook, and as far as its programmatic capability. Right, and 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 I have must obviously and, and tried early and often to admit to not being enough of an Ansible expert to say here's the nuts and bolts of that. 
Um, but I do know, I, I know in a few places, uh, just, uh, and I know we're already over time, but in a few places where we internally use Ansible for some uh, automation tasks, uh, we do have exactly these, you know, uh, superficially Turing complete constructs with loops uh, and fours and, and weights that we use because we're we're using Ansible to deploy some things on servers and there's a, a unlimited number of race conditions because we don't know how long a service is going to take to come up. So it's sitting up in a, in a loop and wait on it. Um, and we definitely do some if then decision trees and that's my zero level Ansible sophistication. <laughs> so I do know that the possibility must exist. Uh, so. And DJ Mehta said this is real easy, all this stuff for Ansible. He's an Ansible fan. Well, thank you so much for that question, DJ Mehta and James. Josh, awesome stuff. Uh, great presentation. I thank you for your time today. We do got to get out of here and let these folks go because I know in Austria it's getting late in the day, right, DJ Mehta? He's over in Austria, over in Europe. James, though, lives right here in my time zone, so he's not too far from me. But, Josh, thank you so much for that. It was a great presentation. Hey, and I really enjoyed it. Absolutely. Well, you guys all have a great evening. We'll see you next week when we start up some new operations classes. Now, some of you may have had them already, but you'll see the new operations master classes. If you've not been there for those, definitely come check those out because that'll be fun. And you'll see more of our schedule coming with more DevNation as we go forward. Thank you guys so much. Bye now. <laughs>